Thank you very much, Jim. I really appreciate that introduction. And thank you for having me and inviting me down. Uh, I've actually been here before in school, and it's always been great to come up here. Beautiful campus, great people. So thank you so much. Uh, what I want to talk about today is immigration. As all of you know, uh, there was something that happened last Tuesday that involves immigration. So I want to talk a little bit about what's going on and give you a little bit of background about how to think about it as we proceed from here on. And uh, let me start by describing. Okay. Let me start by describing what I call the economistic perspective. And that's the perspective that economists have in mind when they first think about immigration. And uh, to many economists, immigration is like trick. This is sort of the way they perceive it, you know. Uh, in the sense that if you're thinking about importing a good from abroad, like a widget made in China, if you import a widget made in China, and it's sort of like importing a high school worker that uh, spent all that time you know, designing the widget and importing the low skilled workers that actually spent all that time producing the widget. After all, widgets don't get me out of thin air, right? Somebody has to do it. And immigration is like trade in the sense that instead of importing the widget, we're importing the people who can now produce the widget in the US. Uh, once you view immigration that very narrow phase, then all the costs and benefits for immigration basically come from whatever happens in the widget collection. No, we're going to show you the fact that you produce widgets that are sold, and you get money, and you get paid, the people working on the immigrants get affected one way or another, but everything just comes from that interaction. Uh, but again, once you think about it in that very narrow way, it's very hard to move yourself to the real world where immigrants uh, really don't have any impact beyond that. Uh, in the real world, immigrants do have impact beyond that, and we tend to know that when we think about it in this very kind of narrow economistic perspective. And if you go through that line of thinking, one thing you learn in, in college, as I said, in economics class, is that trade is great. That's something that you learn from the very beginning. Trade is great. And since immigration is a trade, it therefore follows that immigration is great. And that's a way of thinking that has really permeated immigration. Policies both in trade and in immigration for many, many decades. Uh, the problem is that there's something called the real world out there that tends to interfere with that. Now, Max Frisch is a very well-known Swiss novelist and essayist. And he was observing the migration of Turkish workers into Germany and, men, and many Western European countries back in the 1950s and 1960s. And he came up with what I think is the greatest, most insightful thing ever said about immigration. And it's that thing there that's involved. We wanted workers. Well, we got people instead. And that's where uh, you sort of deviate from the way you can't just think about immigration. Immigrants are not just robots, robots, you want to think about it that way, that come in and produce widgets. Immigrants have all kinds of other effects. And once you see it that way, then you have to take into account that because immigrants are not just worker robots, but actual people, people make decisions. And people make decisions that could be either very beneficial for the country that's receiving the immigrants, or might not be so beneficial for the country receiving the immigrants. And uh, those decisions have all kinds of consequences that extend way beyond the widget factory. And that if you want to get a real assessment for immigration is about, you got to take into account. And let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean by decisions. Not everybody migrates. People choose to migrate. And one of the things we know is that if given the opportunity, a lot of people choose not to move. <coughs> and so the question becomes, which people are coming? And it would not be completely far-fetched if the people who are coming are not precisely the people that the country might need in some sense or might decide in some sense, right? I have a little funny quote there from Ivan Kenobi, you know, saying, well, maybe those are the people we want. And that may well be true, or maybe they are. We just don't know. But clearly, moving beyond the image of immigrants as just these sort of like robots that move from place to place, 
make sure they into account that the people coming in might not fit precisely with what the receiving country is looking for. Immigrants choose whether to assimilate or not. Assimilation is not a universal experience that happens no matter what. And the reason it doesn't happen no matter what is because assimilation is costly. You gotta learn the language. Learning the language is costly. You gotta give up all kinds of other stuff to be able to learn the language. You gotta move to the right cities where jobs are. Moving the right cities might entail you to move from some city where you're comfortable to a city where you're not comfortable. And that's also possible. And depending on the conditions on the ground, immigrants will choose either to assimilate or not. And that has very, very kind, very uh, long-term consequences. Immigrants were ethnic leaders. We did not, but immigrants do. And ethnicity matters, for better or worse. And ethnicity matters for a very, very long time. I mean, just look at the debate in Europe right now. Ethnicity matters. The immigrants are not wizards. Immigrants have lives outside the, outside the factory pits. In the US, in many European countries, something called the welfare state out there. Most of them are, I mean, even though we all wish we could live perfect lives where nothing bad ever happens to us, that's not true. Okay? I'm sorry to disappoint you, but things happen over time. And some of those things tend to make people worse off. And the welfare state is there to provide a safety net for what people need it. When well, immigrants come in, and they actually have a double role in that. They help fund the welfare state because they pay taxes, but they also are useful for the welfare state. And you gotta take that cost benefit into account before deciding whether the country has a whole benefit from immigration or not. Now, this is a narrative out there, okay? And the narrative uh, is this quote here. Paul Collier, in case you've never heard of him, is a very renowned sort of British academic. He works in development, basically, and has written many books on development. He's never really worked on immigration. So as an academic, he wrote many papers on development, but never really wrote any papers on immigration. For some reason, a few years ago, he decided to start writing a book on immigration, even though he had never done any research on it. And he wrote a book on immigration called Exodus, How Immigration is Changing the World. And the book is interesting, and it argues all kinds of stuff. It doesn't really matter what he argues for the point I want to make. The point I want to make is that this young academic, who had never really worked on immigration, decides to write a book about it, and before he writes the book, he has to sort of read all the articles people have written over the last 30 years on this, right? And that quote is sort of describes his reaction to the academic literature on immigration. And he's basically saying, look, a lot of people out there lose no opportunity to point out that immigration is bad. As a result of this, social scientists have strained every muscle to show, to show that migration is good for everyone. That's an error. You know, there's, a, there's been a, a, an interpretation of the evidence that no matter what the data indicate, immigration is great. So again, going back to the straight analogy, immigration is great. And the narrative is accomplished by doing a few things to the data and to the models. And I give you three, three uh, examples there. A lot of academic studies in English tend to ignore the fact that immigrants are not just workers, but people who are. A lot of these studies make a lot of assumptions. And one of the things you learn is that you make assumptions, and if you play, along, if you play long enough with the models and the data, making different assumptions will lead to different answers. And a lot of the time, you tend to overlook inconvenient facts. And that's how the narrative gets built. So what I'm going to do is start with a particular example that shows these three things going on before I move to the US Congress. And the example I'm going to start is with John Lennon, actually. You know that song in many traditional countries? John Lennon that says, it isn't hard to do. Look, I'm a Beatles fan. I've been a Beatles fan my whole life. He's wrong. Okay. Imagine that some countries is extremely hard to do. If you've taken a course in international trade, you know that what economists tend to do in international trade models is imagine what happens when you remove restrictions across countries. What, what would happen if you remove restrictions across countries when people can move anywhere they want? Well, one thing we know is that people can move from the, from the poor countries to the rich countries and get a huge increase in earnings, right? Because the, the north is, you come to the south of the north, 
the North is just much more productive, right? So they get a huge increase in earnings. One of the things that economics teaches you is that when people are left to do what is best for them, that tends to maximize global output, basically. It's best for the, the whole the economy as a whole. Well, it turns out that it's true. I mean, that all these papers claiming that if we just remove international borders, global GDP will go by a lot. And the first rule that I have there is actually a prediction for that model, that world GDP will go by $40 trillion. I don't know if you've heard the phrase, there are trillion dollar bills on the sidewalk for the taking, if only countries would remove the, the, the frontier and let people move in. So the whole case for open borders is precisely the model. I mean, you imagine what you're going to to imagine. Oh, well, no countries, people are going to move around, equalize conditions all over the world. Raw GDP goes up by 40 trillion. Now, raw GDP right now is 70 trillion. So you can imagine that removing the borders could actually get rid of the poverty problem for the entire world in one full swoop, right? And that's narrow. What the NAP doesn't tell you, what, the, what, what people leave out, is all the other goals there. And it's exactly the same model. So the people who tend to, to push this kind of framework will focus on one number, the 40 trillion, and tend to ignore all the other numbers. And one of the numbers they tend to ignore is how many people will move. In fact, if you believe that 40 trillion dollars, 5.6 billion people have to move to the industrialized world in order to accomplish that. Now you don't quite hear that very often because if you hear that number, you realize that the whole exercise is sort of <coughs> total quicksand, right? I mean, realistically speaking, it's impossible for the northern, for the, for the industrialized countries to accept 5.6 billion people and maintain whatever it is that, that, that makes them productive. The other thing you don't hear is that there's gonna be a huge redistribution as a factor for this one month. I mean, when people move, wages are equalized. The reason that people move to the north is because uh, the wage is higher here. But if, as more people move, the wage here will go down, and the wage in the south will go up until the things are equalized. And you can sort of see the equalization of wages, what that will do, right? You will decrease the wage in the north by 40% or something like that, and increase the wage in the south by 140%. And by the way, capital is gaining a lot too. The firms will lap all the way to the bank as a result of this. You know, those with distributional impact <coughs> tend to be forgotten. I mean, they tend to be not stressed when people discuss the gains of open work. And what I want to point out is that all these models of economic globalization imply all kinds of things, not just one number. And to get a complete picture, it's really important to include the whole picture. What, what the model implies in total, as opposed to just concentrating one number. The other thing I want to point out is this, which is that, to the point I was making before, it is hard to imagine that you can get 5.6 million people moving and nothing happens to the north. Well, if something happens, I'm not going to go through the whole table because I don't want to go through the details, it's, too, it's, not, it's not important, but just imagine in your head, if something were to dilute the productivity effect of what the north now has, then that gain is going to be reduced. And it doesn't take much to make it negative. Again, it is not widgets that are moving, but people. And that is something that I want to stress over and over again, because part of what the immigration debate has ignored is by, is by looking at people like they're, they're just widget makers, you're forgetting the whole picture. And that whole picture could be very good or very bad, it's not clear. But one has to look at the whole picture before making a decision about all this. Now let me turn to the US. <laughs> And I'm going to start with something that will surprise many of you, and it is assimilation. I was telling you before that assimilation is not automatic, right? So this is actual data, okay? This is like data from the US census over the last, basically, basically over the last 70, 80 years. And each of these lines is basically telling you how fast immigrant wages go up for a particular cohort. So if you look at the top line, those for the people who arrived between 1955 and 1959. People who arrived in the late 1950s. And you can use census data to track. So for example, you can look at the 60 census, you'll know how they boom when they arrive. You can look at the 70 census, you'll know how they do it English later, right? And that line tells you how fast the earnings grew as compared to natives. You can see they grew pretty fast. In a, in a, in a decade, the wage went up by almost 15%. 
Okay, that's because that's another one economic assimilation. The same thing is true for the 60s arrival, the late 60s. You can see that there too, right? In fact, the same thing is true for a lot of arrivals. Except that if you go to the 1980s arrival and the 1990s arrival, you see a pattern, right? You sort of see this sort of flattening of assimilation. For whatever reason, the immigrants who are arriving in recent years are not catching up to natives as quickly as they used to. And it's true, that actually has a very important implication for the, ne the near future, right, for the next 50 years. Because if we now have 42 million immigrants in the US, and the number is growing, and if they're not catching up to natives very quickly, or in fact staying flat, that's going to have all kinds of economic consequences down the line, right? <coughs> no, so that's a fact. This is not fancy econometrics. You can actually download the data yourself. It's publicly available data and, re and replicate this in 25 minutes if you use data, okay? Now, a lot of people will look at this graph and say, look, that might be true, but there's no need to worry. And the reason there's no need to worry is because the U.S. has a long history of immigration. It always works out. <laughs> and the, the, the thing they will bring up is, look, back in 1900, we admitted many immigrants. We all worked out. And that's a widely held belief, which new work is actually beginning to show and not be completely true. So this is a quote from a paper by Radar and at Stanford and Bustana and Erickson regarding assimilation back in the early 1900s. Now what they did is really, really clever. In the US, we have all these censuses, right? And all the old censuses, like 1910, 1920, and so on, are now public information. So you can actually go to the census and find a particular person, like Alexander Smith, and you can try, and who was born in Wales, say, and you can find that person in 1800, in 1910, in 1920, just track and you see what happened as this Mr. James got older, right? And uh, that's what they did. They actually used census data that way. They track people, and when you do, when you find, when you find, when you track people that way is the quote that I have there, which is the notion that European immigrants converge with natives is exaggerated. As we find the initial immigrant native occupational gaps persisted over time. And that's sort of the revisionist point of view on what happened 100 years ago. There is actually remarkably little evidence that in their lifetime, the immigrant for over 100 years ago did very well. But now, that really, you look at the whole century long sort of pattern, that really brings up a really interesting question, okay? The 20th century has two bookends, basically, of mass migrations, right? You know, the other island era migration and the migration we're in now. The people who came in the middle of that assimilated quite well. The people who came at the end of that, or the beginning of that, of the, of the century, you don't see this assimilation, which makes you think is it possible that perhaps mass migration is not conducive to assimilation? And one really good, simple reason is, look, mass migration means that there are many, many, many large ethnic enclaves. And it's great to live in an ethnic enclave if you don't have ethnicity, you don't have to bother with the language. It provides basically a built-in environment for you to get along with having to invest in assimilation. Now, we don't know whether that's true or not yet, but what we do know is that the people who migrate to the US in an era of small assimilation do much better than the outcome of small immigration, do much better than the people who migrate to the US in an era like the beginning of, or the end of the 20th century of a lot of immigration. So that's one of the of the of the, the narrative is wrong in that case. Now let me skip that and turn to this, which is another big issue in the public debate right now. So plan the end. The supply of oil goes up, the price of gas goes down, right? You know, if you take an economics class, you know that you learned that from day one, supply and demand, and nobody would argue with that. Now, uh, this is a quote from Paul Simons, okay? Now, most of you here will have no idea what Paul Simons it is. You're way too young to know. But let me tell you right now that Paul Simonson was probably the most influential economist of the 20th century. He wasn't Keynes, he wasn't Friedman, he was probably Paul Simonson. And the reason is that in this dissertation, he basically began the process of making economics mathematical, in some general sense. 
So the reason that all these economic papers are hard to read and they're going to pass a really hard time on that, go back to the science. Okay. And uh, so Paul Simonson also wrote a textbook. So have you been taking Econ 101 back in 1950, 1960, 1970? The textbook you would have used is almost surely Paul Simonson. So what I did was to go back to Paul Simonson in the, in the mid-60s, before the mass migration era of today. And I look up to see what did he think about immigration. And that's a quarter of the textbook. After World War I, we passed laws that limited immigration. That's correct. You know, as a result of the other side of the era, the U.S. closed the door for many decades. Only the of immigrants have been admitted since then, which is correct. As of 1964, that's correct. By keeping labor supply down, immigration policy tends to keep wages high. So blending in, right? Uh, now, the problem with that statement is that, let's try to translate that to today's world. Since 1964, since he wrote these words, laws were passed that liberalized immigration. Many, many immigrants, 42 million as a matter of fact, have been admitted since then. By keeping labor supply high, immigration policy keeps wages low. That's exactly the same statement in reverse, right? So you can supply one way or the other. <coughs> the problem is that when you put it the way you just put it, applying it to today's framework, uh, that is highly disputed. Because it's clearly, it, 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 it breaks an app that immigration is good for everyone, right? There are workers out there who are being hurt by immigrants because immigrants come in and increase supply. Uh, now, what I want to show you is, again, examples of, of how an average is built. But I want to show the example by showing you supply and demand in real life. Now, in your classes, you've seen supply and demand with graphs, right? The new curves that cross and all that stuff. I want to show you supply and demand in real life. In September 2006, when George W. Bush was president, he began to have, um, as, part of his, as part of his policy of trying to liberalize immigration and giving undocumented immigrants amnesty, he became serious about enforcement. And there was a lot of enforcement in a couple of years. And one of the enforcement things he did was to send immigration agents to factories and just arrest all the undocumented immigrants. So on Labor Day weekend in 2006, the agents raided Crider. Crider is a chicken processing plant in very rural Georgia. Over that Labor Day weekend, Crider lost 75% of its workers. In fact, the, the Wall Street Journal has a really nice article on all this, describing the raid, describing everything that happened. Now, Samuel Johnson has a great quote that fits very nicely in this context. When a man knows how to be hanged, to be hanged, he concentrates his mind wonderfully. So Crider wakes up, or the people who want Crider wake up on Monday morning, or Tuesday morning at the Labor Day, and say, what do we do? 75% of our workforce is gone, right? Supply gone, right? Shift the supply. What do we do? We can't operate the plant. We're going to go broke. We're going to lose tons of money. What did Crider do? They put an ad in the paper. That's the ad. And the ad, as you can see, says increased wages. Less supply, you pay more. When there are more people to choose from, you pay less. When there were fewer people to choose from, you pay more. So that's supply and demand. And to me, this is far more convincing than all the equations and, and graphs you possibly hold in here. A firm faced with a substantial loss will do what any rational firm would do. You have more workers, you put their practice. You have a huge capital waiting to be used that, you, that, that you're going to lose money from, you're going to use it, but you need work. You try to bring in initial biologists. That's a blind demand in your life. Another example is this, which is a paper at Rolassi about Marielle. Uh, Marielle was an event that happened back in 1980. Uh, Castro had not allowed many humans to leave prior to this event back in 1980. And all of a sudden, political conditions in Cuba became sort of untenable for his regime. And he decided to let people go. But the way that people could leave was by family members in the US literally renting or buying boats that they could go down to Marielle 
and pick up their relatives there, my relatives at court in near Havana, and pick up their relatives there, and then bring them back. That Marielle through boat lift brought about 120,000 people to the U.S. And uh, that meant that over, within six weeks, the workforce of Miami had increased by 8%. David Card wrote a very famous paper about this back in 1990, claiming that this huge supply shift had not impacted Miami's workforce in any way. So I'm writing this book last year, and a couple of people told me, you know, your chapter on the labor market impact is way too hard, too hard to understand. Why can you do something simple like Marielle? So one morning I wake up and I said, okay, look at Marielle. What does the data really say to me? And I noticed right away that one thing that David Card had not done was to look at the group of people who were specifically most affected by Maria. I told you before that 120,000 people came over, right? In six weeks. And it's true, nothing happened to the average wage in Miami. That is correct. David Card is correct. But what David Card ignored was the fact that of the 120,000 who came, almost two thirds were high school dropouts. So the number of high school dropouts in Miami we know by almost 20% in six weeks. So you will say to yourself, if Marielle is going to have an impact, then people should be looking at the high school dropouts, right? Well, that's the graph of what happened to the wage of high school dropouts in Miami and outside Miami after 1980. And you can see very, and those, those shades are like the, the confidence interval, the margin of error, right? You can see very clearly that Miami's wage for high school dropouts changed substantially since 1980. And in fact, it's also clear they changed substantially around 1995 or so, right? That's actually another Mario World lift that Castro also allowed in the mid 1990s. So the two Mario kind type of boat lifts, you can see the very clear impact they had on Miami. Now I mentioned before as an narrative, immigration is great; it doesn't hurt anybody. This is go this goes against the narrative, right? Well, within three months after I had put this paper out, there were counterattacks in this paper. And I want to show you how the counterattacks, so again, by manipulating data, you can switch the story about it. And this is the graph. I'm going to call this, this figure, whom to believe, part one. In the left side is my graph, which I actually, when I do this, when I, when I do this in class, where I present a paper in a seminar, I actually work out the graph by hand. It takes about 10 minutes to work out. And you can do it from, Download the, the publicly available data, you can go by hand and convince people, my God, there's something there. But the paper that was written three months after me, trying to knock my work out, is the right, the graph of the right. And they're both right. I mean, that's the data. The, the, there's no computer mistake in any of this, right? These are both correct data sets. But look, how, look at the difference. In curtain number one, I'm looking at male non Hispanic high school dropouts, age 25 to 59. The graph on the right is looking at all known Cuban high school dropouts, age 16 to 61. Now, most of you here are just, you know, in your late teens or early 20s, which is great because you understand what I want to say. The, the data you used to do this, which is called the Current Population Survey, CPS, doesn't tell you whether these people are enrolled in school or not. So the way that we define whether you're a high school dropout or not is you have a high school degree. Now, in my data, in the, in the graph on the left, I looked at people, I looked at prime age workers, 25, 59. In the criticism, they looked at people who are teenagers, 16, 17, 18 years old. But think of yourselves back when you were 16, 17, 18 years old. Did you have a high school degree? No. They have poor high school dropouts. And there are so many people in high school that I contaminated them completely and these two graphs, that's pure garbage. And that's the kind of way that unless you read the footnotes to these papers, it is very, very hard to decide of what is going on. So just the simple redefinition of high school students as high school dropouts, simply because they don't have a high school degree yet, is enough to take the result away. And then you have to ask yourself the question, which graph is correct? Which makes the most, the most sense? Let me then turn to the surplus from all this. I was saying before that uh, the wage goes down. 
for natives that compete with immigrants. But when the wage goes down for natives that compete with immigrants, somebody else gains. Because somebody else is paying a lower wage. So employers gain. And one of the things you learn in economics is like free trade, right? Some people do, some people gain. But the gains accruing to the winners are larger than the loss accruing to the, the loss suffered by the losers. So the, Navy, the, the economic pie goes up. And that's what we call the immigration service. And in fact, the economic pie goes up by $50 billion a year. So the size of the pie, the amount that the wealth accruing to natives goes up by around $50 billion a year. But again, and that number you hear all the time, the number you don't hear the numbers below that, which is that there's a huge redistribution of wealth. And that redistribution is around half a trillion dollars, half hundred billion dollars. So to generate a gain of 50 billion, you need a 500, trillion, a 500 billion dollar transfer of wealth from the work to the employers. Now, I have a second graph here, whom to believe part two, okay? And it relates to this table. One last thing in this table is look at the last two rows. Total increase in GDP is two trillion. But that's because immigrants have to get paid, right? I mean, immigrants don't work for free. So what we really accrues to natives is very small. It's 50 billion. There's a huge increase in GDP, which is true, two trillion dollars, but immigrants have to get paid to do that work. And what that's left over for natives is 50 billion dollars, right? Now, look at this. About a couple of months ago, I'm sure you were in the room that the National Academy of Sciences released a report on the consequences of immigration. Full disclosure, I was a member of the panel that wrote the report, uh, but it was in all of the papers. And what I did was to take three stories out of newspapers referring to the same report. Okay? So the numbers that are here, they're all basically the report. Okay? Even though I did it for myself, that is the only one model to, use to, to calculate this, and the report did this, and they basically came up with the same numbers. And these are the, the, the newspaper stories telling you what the report said. Look at the headline number one. <coughs> two trillion reasons why immigrants make America great. Okay, that's true. That's the fourth goal there, right? Total increase in GDP of two trillion dollars. Look at uh, uh, you know headline number two. National Academy high five hundred billion dollar immigration tax in that report. A very long report. That's five hundred billion dollar shift from workers to firms, right? They didn't stress it too much, but it's there. If you look in percentage terms, you guys don't work it out by hand, but it's there. And uh, quote number three from the New York Times, I just put it in, shade, in, in, in a little shadow as you can see it. The National Academy of Science has released a report that the immigration surge uh, uh, produced net benefits for the native born beyond those accruing to the immigrants themselves of 50 billion a year. That's from the New York Times. And that too is correct, right? Now, the question is, if you only read one of these headlines, you get a very different picture of what the data really say, right? The, what the data really say is all this. The data really say, look, natives are transferring wealth from the workers to the employers. That transfer of wealth is substantial. The economic pie for natives goes up a little bit, 50 billion. And the economic pie in general, including what immigrants get, goes up a lot by two trillion. All these facts are correct. But by emphasizing different parts of what the, the, the totality is, you get very different pictures of what immigration is about. All right. Home to believe part three. Uh, so this I just, just, something I have to work out in my class because I want to show people how easy it is to manipulate data, okay? And get the answer you want to get. Uh, you often hear in the debate, immigrants use welfare more often than natives, where immigrants don't use welfare more often than natives, depending on who you read, right? Well, uh, here are two graphs showing you the fraction of people or the fraction of immigrants on welfare. And in curtain number one, say, let's make a deal, if you go back long enough of that, not three curtains, but two curtains, uh, in the curtain number one, immigrants use welfare a lot more than natives. Curtain number two is basically the same thing, right? And 
Let me tell you. You can generate these two graphs using exactly the same data. The reason these graphs begin in 1994, because that's, when 19, that's the year in which the CPS began to collect data on immigration. So we actually have over 20 years of data now where households in the US are, you know, people are asked, do you receive welfare or not? And by welfare in these graphs, we mean basically things like cash benefits or food stamps or Medicaid. So you use that data, and depending on how you do it, you can get in the graph. And both are correct. Now, let me, show you, let me tell you what's going on here. In curve number one, what is done here, which is what the National Academy did, by the way, and the way it's usually studied, is that in the US, welfare is usually, is usually allocated at the family level, at the household level. So for example, if a single mother has children, if that family <coughs> unit that qualifies for food stamps or Medicaid, right? And the way it's done in curve number one is to say, is this family unit an immigrant family unit or a native family unit? So let me give you the story. Suppose a single mother comes from abroad now, right? And she's single. I mean, actually, let me, let me rephrase that. Suppose a single woman comes from abroad now, and she's by herself. In the next couple of years, she meets a significant other, and they procreate and have a couple of kids down the line, right? In curtain number one, this unit, and then the guy leaves. In curtain number one, this unit of the mother and a couple of children will be an immigrant household, right? Because the woman is an immigrant. And it will go into the immigrant column. They receive Medicaid, they go into the immigrant column. In curve number two, I'm going to play a little trick. Instead of doing it at the household level, let's do it at the person level. So now we have three people to contend with. We have an immigrant woman and two native kids. The household is on welfare. One immigrant goes on welfare. Two natives go on welfare. And look what happens to the data. They're both right, but one of them is central and one of them is not. And unless you read the footnotes, it's very hard to tell which is the correct one. And the footnotes, the, the, a lot of stuff that you see in the press is put up by think tanks that have a particular actual one. And don't report the footnotes. So unless you actually read what's going on here, it's very difficult to ascertain which of these things to believe. But in reality, you have to sort of say to yourself, what is the correct way to think about this? Now, the National Academy actually does everything according to the family, which is much more sensible, right? Because if the, the decision of whether to accept an immigrant or not depends on the whole world on the impact of this. Now, uh, let me show you a little bit about the, about the impact, the fiscal impact. So this is the percentages of welfare. In the National Academy report that was published a couple of months ago, uh, there are two chapters where they actually try to calculate uh, how much this costs. And look, if you start with curve number one, as sort of the basis of looking at this, it is almost inevitable you're going to find that immigrants are in net fiscal burden, okay? for better or worse. And uh, the, reason, the, way, the reason for that is that immigrants in the US over the last 30, 40 years tend to have a very large sort of low skill component. And as I said before, the welfare state is here to protect everybody. It's not because they're immigrants. It's because they are low skill, and bad, thi bad things happen to all people, including everybody, right? And the welfare state is designed to protect the low skill from having these bad shocks. So as a result of the National Academy, what they did was put up all the benefits, all the taxes they immigrants pay, and compare that to all the expenditures they incur. And the number they came up with was $57 billion in the short run. So in other words, if you do it in a year, three, like if you do it this year, and you add up all the taxes immigrants pay for state and local governments, okay, this is state and local, and all the revenues that immigrants, all, all the taxes immigrants pay, and all the expenditures they incur, right, in terms of welfare, education, and so on and so forth, it's around $57 billion. <coughs> Now, in that, and this is, this is not my data, it's National Academy data in the report. If you were to include federal government expenditure, that number could go up a lot. A couple of hundred billion. And they have that number in the report as well. Now, let's be the most conservative 
there's at least a zero in negative, right? So you know you put two and two together, and you come up with a, the, the result that look oh, on net doesn't really matter that much. All this debate, and on net it doesn't really matter that much. You know whatever evidence contribute to negatives gets eaten away by the fiscal impact. But even though on net it might not matter so much, it actually matters because there are winners and losers, right? The people who compete with immigrants, the workers, lost. The people who hire immigrants, the employers, gained. And it's that conflict that's really at the core of the immigration debate. You know, how do you resolve this redistribution going on? where some people win, some people lose. And uh, on average, it doesn't matter. So once you see it that way, and you, look at, you can see who's on which side, it tells you, it helps you understand much more that, look, immigration can be paid. It doesn't have to. Immigrants are not victims. They have all kinds of other impacts that affect the economy. Even within the economy, forget about the cultural impact, forget about all the social things that may happen. Just in the economic realm, even has all kinds of consequences that you gotta take into account to get a, a, a much better picture, okay? So let me conclude with a, a quote that I have in my book, uh, which is this. Because of this distribution, whenever you take any immigration policy, you're basically making a statement as to who you care about, who you're rooting for. It's making a statement about whether you care about immigrants, whether you care about natives. It's making a statement as to which group of natives you care about. Do you care about employers? Do you care about the workers? Do you care about high school workers or low school workers? It's impossible to devise an immigration policy that will make everybody better off. Look, Think about it realistically. We've now admitted over 40 million immigrants in the US in the last 30, 40 years. You really believe that immigration will be so contentious as it is if everybody had gained? It's the fact that everybody gained, that some people have been left behind, that leads to this debate being so contentious and so political. So once you said, I mean, once you decide to have this kind of immigration policy, you have to realize by putting those, that policy out on paper, you're making a choice. You're making a choice as to who the winners are and who the losers are. If you want an immigration policy that, for example, lets in a lot of high school workers, you know, look at the newspapers on the H1P program. You know, you've read all about what happened at Disney, right? Where the people who used to work at Disney had to play their replacements. Disney gained a lot, <coughs> we may gain a lot. We get cheaper programmers, right? And we can move whatever we did, you know, we can see the next Disney movie at a dollar cheaper or something. But the people who used to be there are going to lose all. So you have to make that choice. Who is it that you care about? Okay? And, and that I think is sort of the that I think is sort of what I want. In, in an ideal world, the immigration debate would not really be about all these numbers. Okay, you know, if the weights impact a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars or whatever, right? That's really irrelevant in the scheme of things. What's really relevant is who are you willing, who are you, who are you willing for? Who do you want to benefit? And, and who's going to pay for the cost of those benefits? Because somebody will have to pay. Immigration is not, is not like man from heaven. You know, somebody will pay for whatever benefits are to everybody else. And who are you choosing to be the, the beneficiaries? And who are you choosing to be the losers? Okay. Now let me finish by doing a little plug to the book uh, that just came out about a month ago. It got great reviews in Amazon, great reviews in the New Yorker, and stuff like that. It's only 18 something or other at uh, Amazon, 12.99, the Kindle version. Uh, I strongly recommend it. My family strongly recommends it. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>